Some people just want to move out because they've had it, but I think they need to take a beat and think about that because depending on who may be paying the mortgage during the divorce proceedings or if you move out before you even file, then there may be some ramifications to your claim on that domain. Are you getting the attention you deserve from your financial advisor? Well, if you're not, call our partner, Edelman Financial Engines at 833-304-PLAN or visit planefe.com slash hermoney. As a hermoney listener, you'll get a complimentary financial plan to help you decide. Hey everyone, I'm Jean Chatsky. Thank you so much for being with us today on Her Money. On our show, on every single show that we produce, actually, we talk about the complicated relationships that women have with money. They are complicated in how we earn it, how we spend it, invest it, save it. And those relationships get even more complicated when our personal relationships, specifically our marriages, come to an end or hit the skids. Statistically, we know that divorce is really hard on a woman's finances. According to a report from the U.S. Government Accountability Office, women's household income drops by an average of 41% after a divorce. And while there are many different reasons for this, a lot of it goes back to women earning less than men to start with and women not insisting on taking a share, their share of their partner's retirement accounts in a divorce, which can leave them less prepared for the future. And as a result, nearly a third of newly divorced women say that they are struggling to make ends meet. And with women living an estimated five years longer than men at that point, that dip in income, it can have some really serious long-term consequences. In 2022, about 44% of all marriages are expected to end in divorce. That rate always sort of hovers somewhere between 40 and 50%, depending on the year. It's actually been dropping a bit, which having been divorced, I think is really good news. But we're also seeing that the rates of gray divorce are higher than they've ever been. Since 1990, we've seen a doubling of the rate of divorce for people over 50, a tripling of divorce rates for people 65 and over. Divorce is never easy. I went through it. As I said, I've talked about it on this show many, many times, even when it's something that we want. It is not easy and it is not fun. And according to a Stanford University study, women actually initiate about 70% of all divorces. I had not heard that one before. That was a little surprising to me. If you're going through a divorce or a separation, I just want to say that your Her Money family is here for you. We are here for you every step of the way. We have a lot of women actually who are going through a divorce or just coming out of a divorce who are enrolling in our finance fix courses just to get a, a renewed grip on their personal finances and to do a little bit of planning. So if that sounds like something that you need, we've got new classes starting every single month. But today we are giving you a guide for what might lie ahead. We're going to get really tactical about some of the moves that you should be taking to set yourself up for success and to make sure that you have the financial freedom that you deserve in the years to come. We're going to do it with Kimberly Davis. She is the manager Managing Director and Partner at the Bonson Group. They are a bi-coastal wealth management firm, and she's a certified divorce financial analyst. She helps women transition to financial independence after life-altering events like death or divorce. She's also got a great new book. It's called The Fiscal Feminist, A Financial Wake-Up Call for Women. It literally just hit bookstores. Kimberly, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today, Jean. I'm really excited to talk about this topic, even though it is a bit of a gnarly topic, because, you know, divorce is always a challenge and not pleasant in many circumstances. If you're lucky, maybe you have a pleasant divorce, but it's not the norm, I don't think. You do need to have a strategy and be tactical about pre-gaming it and even My advice is to think about it even before you get married. Well, let me stop you there because I don't want you to get ahead of yourself. I'm sure we will bring around the conversation to thinking about it before you get married and maybe thinking even about a prenup. But I just want the audience to know that you're not just a professional. You've been there and done that, right? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your story. 
So I am a wealth manager. I was a lawyer for many years in the early 80s and 90s, and then became an investment banker. And so I was, you know, starting on my professional trajectory back then when everybody was making moves in the women's movement. And I am someone who did get divorced after 23 years of marriage. I would not be a wealth manager today or have written this book or started the Fiscal Feminist Platform. I also do podcasts and blogs and things like that. If I hadn't gotten divorced, it literally changed my life completely around. What happened? Well, so the first thing was that after having my first child, who is now 31 and is also a lawyer working in New York City, you know, my ex-husband was in private equity and he was asked to move to London. It was supposed to be for two years. He still lives there. This is about 30 years later. And I moved back to the United States after 14 years. But that one decision had a huge impact on my life because when the handwriting was on the wall that he was never coming back here and the marriage was deteriorating, I had taken a big step out of my professional career. Now, while I was in London, I did other things because I wasn't really equipped to do my profession there, you know, getting the work papers and the correct certifications. Yeah, practicing there with, law in a yeah, different it's, country. It's that's really whole, tough. Yeah, whole new thing. So I started a fashion business there. I actually was the designer and manufacturer of the clothing. We sold the clothes to the 10 best stores in Saks Fifth Avenue. So it was, you know, moderately successful, but I was trying to fill in the gap for self-realization, right? To do something with my life because my children were getting older. But when When I finally decided to come back to the United States, I was a 53-year-old woman. The divorce was occurring in London, so I had to keep going back to London to go through a very long and protracted litigated divorce. And there was no prenup. I was always busy with the children or taking care of other people. And to my detriment, and someone in my background, you would think this wouldn't happen to you, but I had taken my eye off the ball Mm -hmm. of our finances and our situation. So when we first started to talk about this and then I knew he was going to file for divorce, I was advised I should file first, which I did. But then he immediately cut off all of our bank accounts oh, like, boy. within the day. So I had to go and get an interim order against him. Now, remember, I'm in California. This is happening in London so that I would at least have some money for the children and I, because two were in high school and one was starting Georgetown. So Long story short, we went through this protracted first decree, which came out to give me some sort of alimony and a settlement, but I still had to pay for everything for the children, which he was giving me some money for. But six months after that, he stopped paying. He just stopped. And it's a long story about how he accomplished that. But bottom line, I mean, I'm going to actually stop you Mm -hmm. from laying out what sounds like a horrendous story because I want to get to the advice for everybody else. Uh Bottom line, you got a really lousy deal. I did. But the good news from it was because he stopped paying and it took another two years to get that resolved, which ended up, I then went to work at Morgan Stanley because I you know, had my resume and my background, became a wealth manager, and then my career started to kind of evolve. But the reality was, is that this could have ended very differently for me, and it could have been very sad. So I had a great divorce, I wasn't prepared, and I could have ended up living in a much lesser lifestyle in my retirement. And also, I might not have been able to complete certain objectives that I had for my kids. So, but the only thing that what kept you from that reality, it sounds to me, was your ability to earn. Correct. In terms of a settlement, no. it was not a good one, right? Yeah. And and so as we think about this for other women, I think it's really important to have a game plan to come out of this and think about your career. But before we get there, I actually want to talk about the divorce itself. I want to talk about how do you look at the retirement planning, the property, the investments, the estate planning, right? Your title in your book is a financial wake-up call for women. What's the wake-up call? Well, the first thing is knowledge is power. So like with any other logistical major move in your life, you need to kind of pregame 
any type of divorce action. So if you think you're going to file for divorce or you think somebody else is going to file for divorce, then I would not be in such a hurry to do that until you have laid the foundation for this next step. What does that that mean to pregame? Can we get really specific? Yes, yes. So the first thing I would say is many women that I talk to really often don't have any clue as to maybe what their husband earns, how much retirement funding has gone on in their individual 401ks, and they don't have a full picture of the joint finances. So I would say the first thing they need to do before anybody does anything, or if you think something is afoot, is to and even before that, you should do this, have a clear picture of your joint and individual financial situation. What do I mean by that? You need to have a balance sheet. You need to understand all the assets that are in the marital corpus, so to speak, all the marital assets, you know, real estate, cars, each of your retirement plans, investment accounts. If you have a business, a family business, people should be looking at their tax returns and understand what are on those schedules, because that will list all the granular ownership of investments, companies, and so on and so forth. A lot of women, I think, may not look at those tax returns so granularly before they sign, and they should be doing that, because that's where they're going to see hidden assets if there are some. So even during the marriage, I would suggest everybody be very informed of what all the assets are and also then what are all the liabilities, mortgages, notes, any kind of loans associated with the business. These are all the things that you need to understand because that's going to give you your clear picture. It's so interesting. So as a woman who's gone through a divorce, and I'm sure you're because you're a professional who works in this space as well, like I feel like I'm one of the first calls whenever anybody in my orbit thinks that they're getting a divorce. And this is the advice that I give them, right? Even if you're not looking at the finances, even if you haven't been looking at the finances, you got to look at it. You got to look at all the paperwork. And that may be a hard thing to do if you're not comfortable in understanding it or figuring it out. But there are professionals, there are financial advisors, Mm -hmm. and there are divorce planners who are out there and available to help you. Right. And I mean, this is what's going to kind of determine the infrastructure of your future life. You know, documentation drives divorce. Once someone files for divorce, their soon-to-be ex-spouse may not be so willing to produce documentation. So this is why, you know, all of a sudden things might get a little fuzzy. Documents might be hard to come by. You may have to subpoena them. Or all of a sudden a law firm or family business that was doing very well before the divorce is all of a sudden not doing very well because, I don't know, they're getting divorced and all of a sudden they say the company isn't making any money. So it's really important to get all of these documents together, to have them either on your computer in a file or print them out and put them somewhere safe. So that's the first thing you really want to do. And then the second thing you really want to do is check your credit report. It's very, very important that women are reviewing their credit reports, really checking into, you know, your debt and is inextricably tied to your spouse, especially in a community property state. But nine times out of 10, you're going to have a lot of joint credit cards with each other and incur debt together and joint tenancy. So you need to understand what's going on with that credit report, because there could be things occurring that your spouse has been doing that you may not be apprised of, and that will be revealed in the credit report. So specifically, you're looking at your credit score, right? But you're also, when you look at a credit report, it doesn't actually give you your score. You want to pull your score from a separate source, like a Credit Karma or a Bankrate.com. Or or, Right. But if you're pulling your credit report itself, which everybody's able to do for free these days, thanks to the pandemic, we have almost unlimited access to our credit reports. When you're looking at it, what are the warning signs? Accounts that don't belong to you? Collections? I mean, what are you specific or just anything that you don't know about? Well, yeah, and that's the thing. There will be, obviously, you have to look at all the accounts that are open and what the balances are on those accounts. Are you familiar with those accounts? Do those balances look like they're in the realm of possibility of what you as a couple have been spending? Are there accounts that you're not aware of? And then also, are some of the accounts in delinquency? Have there been some bankruptcies filed that you know in the past that maybe you don't know about? You know, they're very telling, these reports, and they go back several, several years. So you can see a lot of activity that's occurred in the past, and then you can become apprised of that. So you know what you're dealing with, because you as a 
married person, if you have not had credit cards in the past in your own name, and this is the third thing I tell people to do, you may not have that much credit available to you after your divorce. You may have to start from ground zero. I had a double whammy with that because I was coming from England. I hadn't lived in the United States for 14 years. So I literally had no credit in this country. I literally had to buy my first car when I moved here for cash. I couldn't get a car loan because they didn't know who I was. But you should try to establish a credit card on your own before you get divorced and even during the course of a marriage, just so you have a credit card or two credit cards that is singularly in your name. Okay, great, great advice. What's the third step? One thing I want to remind women is if you have been married less than 10 years, you will not be able to get the spousal benefit in Social Security of your husband or soon-to-be ex-husband. If you are somebody maybe in a gray divorce, this is something you might want to consider because If you are married for 10 years or longer and you don't get remarried again and your social security is less than your spousal benefit, you can get the spousal benefit of your ex-spouse. It doesn't matter if he gets married 10 times again. As long as you were married 10 years or longer and you do not get um, remarried before the age of 62 or after, but you, you can claim on that spousal benefit. So I have had people come in in like their ninth year of marriage and they hadn't worked, so they would need that spousal benefit for Social Security. So I've advised them if they could just hang in there for a bit, it would be to their advantage to do so. That's just kind of a sidebar about timing of divorce. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that's that's great advice. And it's also really important advice if you're thinking of remarrying, right? If you're older and you're thinking of remarrying and you are looking at a serious chunk of your support coming from that former spouse, you may want to be very, very careful there. When do we start putting together a team? When do we look for a divorce attorney? Who else needs to be on it? I was told when I was going through it, you need an attorney, you need a financial advisor, you need an accountant. And by the way, it's a good idea if you get a therapist. Right. And before we go to that, there's one other thing I would like people to think about. I'm sorry, and I will talk about the team in a minute. I would like people to think about in their pregame strategy, and that is their living situation. Mm. Some people would just want to move out because they've had it, but I think they need to take a beat and think about that because depending on who may be paying the mortgage during the divorce proceedings or if you move out before you even file, then there may be some ramifications to your claim on that domain. So, like what? Well, you know, the court could factor into the fact you know, that you're, maybe your spouse was paying all the mortgage payments when you moved out during the divorce proceedings. And that will impact the distribution regarding that house and the ownership calculation. So people need to think about that and consult with professionals before they move out in a tizzy. So that's just one thing I wanted to add to this. And then, of course, my last thing in the pre-gaming is just establishing your team and deciding what kind of divorce you want to have. There are different types of divorces. You can have a mediated divorce, a collaborative divorce, a do-it-yourself divorce, or a litigated divorce. And these all have different professionals involved and and involve different methods of coming up with the final result. Which is your method of divorce of choice, I guess. I mean, I had a litigated divorce, I suppose, because we both had lawyers, right? Well, a litigated divorce, you can have a lawyer. So in a mediation, that's where you pick a professional, it can be a lawyer or it can be a certified divorce financial analyst, it can be other professionals, who is going to be a neutral party that will help you and your spouse negotiate a settlement. Now, the only way a mediated divorce works is if everybody is trying to be reasonable, open and transparent, and you're on sort of good footing with each other. This professional cannot advise either of you. They can give you options to consider, but they can't say, I think you should take that. You need to make those decisions on yourself. So it's cheaper. And you can have a divorce lawyer who you can go back to to consult with on, you know, the things that are being discussed. But it is the cheapest form of doing it. It can be the best for a family if everybody is getting along. There might be less of a contentious nature to it. And, you know, I think it can be more streamlined, but that has to be contingent on people producing documentation 
people being reasonable, and people being willing to negotiate to a final settlement. If the settlement is submitted to the judge and it's very one-sided, then the judge might not approve it anyway, and you might have to go actually to a litigated divorce at that point. A litigated divorce doesn't mean that you have a lawyer. It means that you're actually going to go through the court system to make the decision regarding the splitting of the assets and child custody and support and so on and so forth. And it will be decided by a judge, not by a mediation or in the case of a collaborative divorce, which is another way to go about it, where you actually set up a team. And usually on the team, each of you will have a divorce lawyer. You can have a certified divorce financial analyst or a financial person, maybe a financial advisor, but we can talk about the differences between a regular financial advisor and a CDFA. And it's also recommended to have a therapist. This is like almost a death, right? There's a, Mm -hmm. a whole situation, especially if it's been a long marriage with family, it can be a very emotional time that will influence your decision making. So having this team in a collaborative divorce, everybody has to agree that they are going to come to an agreement. If they don't, then the whole thing just implodes. Right. And for that reason, mediation is sort of the cheapest version because there aren't as many lawyers and lawyer hours involved. Collaborative tends to be second cheapest because people are working toward the same goal. And litigation tends to be the most expensive. Kimberly, I want to dig into the specific property and the splitting up of the property and the different assets that we have to be aware of. But before we do that, I also want to point everybody to the fact that we are sponsored by Edelman Financial Engines. And sometimes you discover that you don't have the right financial advisor for you, that you think maybe you want to break up with your financial advisor, or maybe you just want a second opinion. It really comes down to whether you're getting the attention that you deserve or you're settling. And Edelman Financial Engines, our partner, believes that you shouldn't settle. They model more than 38,000 securities every single month to stress test your portfolio through thousands of scenarios, just like the volatility the market is experiencing today. You can call 833-304-PLAN-PLAN or visit planefe.com slash hermoney. As a hermoney listener, you'll get a complimentary financial plan to help you decide. I'm talking with Kimberly Davis, certified divorce financial analyst and author of The Fiscal Feminist. All right, Kimberly, let's get into the assets. When we're talking about splitting the assets, you talked a little bit about the house earlier, but we also mentioned the fact that sometimes the retirement plan is not looked at as much, particularly by women, as it should be. How do you, when you're looking at the whole pool of assets, how do you advise a client what to consider and what to try to get out of their settlement? Well, everything, you know, really is based on the particular facts and circumstances of each individual's situation, right? So many women are going to want to keep the house, especially if they have a family. And often that is a not optimal and may not even be possible, but they'll fight that corner and try to split the assets so that Maybe they'll give more to the spouse so that they can keep the house. But with respect to the house, you know, there's going to be carrying costs to the house, taxes, you know, maintenance and all that other kind of stuff over the course of years. So unless the woman is getting enough of a settlement or has a job and income coming in, you have to look at the fact that that's actually going to be a cost center for that person. It may not actually be an asset that will give them cash flow and liquidity unless they sell it, which goes against the whole purpose of trying to keep it. So with respect to the house, I think people need to really get real with themselves about, you know, what is the outstanding mortgage? Is the other person going to be willing to buy them out? Or, you know, can they buy them out? And do they have the means and the ability to take on the carrying costs of that house in perpetuity, or at least as long as they think they want to live in it? And so sometimes, People will say, well, you know, I'll keep the house and then you won't have to give me as much of your retirement account or you won't have to give me as much in a settlement. And it really is not to their advantage to do that. And it is an emotional decision. And I think that's the one thing, especially with a lot of 
uh, women who have children that they really are reticent to give up their house. And it is probably a better financial decision to do that. When we look at the investments themselves, whether they're in a retirement plan or not, becomes a really important consideration. Yes. So you can have two types of accounts, right? You have investment accounts that are taxable, which means after tax money has been invested in that. So you may have a joint account with your spouse where you own stocks and bonds and things to that nature that are what we would call a taxable account. Or you may each have your own retirement savings, whether it's in a 401k or an IRA. At that point, you know, you can get what they call a quadro, which is a qualified domestic order. But those usually happen. They happen after the divorce and you need to get a quadro specialist to help you with that. But specifically, I mean, if you've got 10 shares of Pepsi in a brokerage account and 10 shares of Pepsi in a retirement account and you bought them on the exact same day, they're not worth the same thing. Well, you have the benefit of the tax-free savings in the... That's what I want you to talk about. One of the things that became quickly apparent when I was going through my divorce is that the value of an investment is no longer just the value of an investment. You got to look at other factors like when you bought it and what kind of an account you hold it in. Can you explain why some investments, even if we're talking about two shares of stock that are trading at the exact same price in the exact same company, how they can be very different in terms of their value for purposes of a divorce. Okay, so if you have, let's address a taxable account first. If you and your husband or your spouse, partner, whoever, have a taxable account with investments in it, every purchase that you make is gonna have a cost basis. The day that you bought it, it was worth a certain amount of money. Now, if you are going to ever sell that, down the road, you will either have a gain from owning that over the amount of time that you've had it, or you will have a loss depending on how your fortunes go. At that point in time, if you have a gain, then you would pay what they call capital gains taxes. So if you needed to cash out, there would be the tax ramification of that. Now, if you're splitting the assets and you're not going to be selling the positions um, and you're going to continue to hold them, it would be good to do an evaluation of all the cost bases of all of the different investments that you hold to see those that have the greatest amount of gain. Because if you were going to sell them or somehow dispose of this in a sale, then you are going to be stuck with the tax consequences of the capital gains tax. So, for example, in the case of a house, if you own the house on your own in the end, and then you go to sell it, you're no longer going to have that $500,000 exclusion as a married couple. You only have a $250,000 exclusion. So you need to understand what is my cost basis in this house for tax purposes, because that will be an incurred expense for you down the road that might diminish the benefit of receiving that if you have to sell it. Now, if you get a quadro and you get half of someone's 401k or their IRA, then you are getting the vehicle that allows you to grow investments and earnings without any tax consequences. So even if you got the quadro and you wanted to change some positions in that particular IRA, you could do that without any tax consequences. But you will be taxed when you have to start getting required minimum distributions at 72, and that would be at ordinary income tax rates. But you're pushing that out well into your retirement if you don't have to draw on it. But if we're looking at, let's say there's 100 shares of Amazon and it's in a brokerage account and there's 100 Mm -hmm. shares of Amazon in a 401k, the 401k is going to eventually be taxed at ordinary income rates. That is correct. The Amazon, because it was paid for with post-tax dollars, with dollars on which you've already paid taxes, is going to be taxed at capital gain. So the shares that are in the brokerage account are actually more valuable, right? It's not a one-for-one trade. Well, to me, I mean, it's again, it's really unique to the situation of the human being, because if you're not going to sell the Amazon, then this is an intellectual discussion. If you have to sell it, yes, immediately, then you're going to pay 20 percent taxes as opposed to ordinary income taxes. But if you are going to not really need any of this money until you're retired, then the longevity of having all those years of well, maybe not all, but amount of time where you're getting tax-free earnings 
and then you are going to have to pay taxes, perhaps at a lower tax rate in your retirement. I don't know. I'd want to do more of a granular analysis on that. But well, and you I are think correct. you're you're pointing out exactly why we need a certified divorce financial <laughs> exactly. analyst. Exactly. No, taxes and, and come look, into it. Taxes come into this. You need an accountant. You need somebody who can look at the numbers. As we wrap this conversation up, Kimberly, and I let me just apologize to all the listeners whose heads just like <laughs> exploded. I'm sorry, guys. I, I get a little excited about this stuff. You know, if you're going through this, I want you to be protected. I want you to make sure that you have the very best team that you can possibly have. What is a certified divorce financial analyst? How much studying do you have to do to get that credential? Right. So you have to go through a year long course of courses that you've got to take. And then you learn a lot about really about so there are two kinds of states, equitable distribution and community property. So you learn all of those rules and you are very adept at understanding the tax ramifications of a lot of things having to do with the splitting of assets. And they also become familiar with programs that will allow the analysts to kind of run these programs as uh, projections to understand what might be the best way for you to come out with an optimal result. And I think with lawyers, they are not really equipped to do this. And regular financial advisors don't have access to all this other information that, you know, certified divorce financial analysts are specifically taught with respect to division of assets and the tax ramifications related thereto, and also finding hidden assets. When you're a certified divorce financial analyst, you're already a certified financial planner, right? You have to be a certified financial planner You don't planner have to be first. a CFP, no. I was a lawyer, so for me, I never got my CFP. I could have gotten it and gotten like a waiver because I was a lawyer, but you do not have to even be a financial advisor to be a certified divorce financial analyst. Okay. You just right. have to complete the course of study and pass all the tests and continue with the yearly continuing education. Right. And it can it affects everything from property, real property to investments, to forensic accounting and digging up hidden assets, to evaluating how to split businesses up. For many people, they have family businesses that are the source of all of their, their wealth. So it's a very granular look at all of these assets that I think other professionals really don't dig deep into. So Kimberly, I'm sure that Catherine is having the exact same thoughts that I am at this moment, which is that we're going to get a lot of questions. We're going to get a lot of questions from our listeners who are, you know, thinking about this. They're going to be anonymous, which they know is fine with us. Will you come back and help us answer them? Oh, my God. I would love to do that. I mean, okay. this is what the whole thing is about. I want to help every woman in every economic strata to really understand everything about divorce. And I'd love to also encourage everyone who doesn't think they're ever gonna get a divorce to think about having a prenup, a postnup, or a cohabitation agreement because that can solve a lot of problems before you even get to divorce. You know what, we are gonna make that another subject for another time. Kimberly Davis, thank you so much for this great and really, really comprehensive conversation. We got a lot of information here. I know this is one of those shows that people are going to go back and they're going to listen to again, particularly if divorce is on their mind. The book is The Fiscal Feminist, A Financial Wake-Up Call for Women. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Jean. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. And just one more final thing to all those ladies out there and men who are going to get divorced. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And for me, it was a rebirth. And strangely, after a lot of time passed, I kind of thought, you know what? Maybe this was the best thing that ever happened. Amazing. I'd love to remind everyone that Her Money is supported by BCU. BCU measures its success by empowering its members to achieve their financial goals. The credit union wants your banking experience to be both authentic and friendly, which is why its products let you bank in confidence and its caring service gives you peace of mind. You can see if you're eligible for what BCU has to offer at www.bcu.org. And Catherine Tuggle is here with me for our mailbag. Hey, Catherine. Wow. That was a lot. <laughs> that was a it big was. one. It was a lot. It was a lot. And I think part of the fact that it was a lot was me sort of bringing my own experiences to the table. But I thought she was a terrific guest. Really, really comprehensive. Yeah. And honestly, like what you said about 
questions, please, please write into me at mailbag at hermoney.com. And we will have Kimberly back to discuss in more detail because I know I've seen a lot of the women in our private Her Money Facebook group. They actually found us in a divorce group. So they found mm-hmm. Her Money referenced in a group for divorced moms. And we welcome all your questions through the door. So please hit me up. Yeah, absolutely. And the same, I have this theory, and you know, I have this theory that people don't come to a podcast like this just because. We tend to come to a podcast like this because something is going on in our life that makes us decide we just want to learn more about our money. Or maybe it's something bigger, like a divorce, and we want to be here for all of those moments in your life. And that's why I think that, you know, when I look at some of the finance fix groups, you know, we have seen a number of women who are are going through divorce or at least thinking about a divorce because it's a safe space to ask your questions. I do want to point out one of the things that Kimberly said was there's this difference between a certified divorce financial analyst and a, she called it a regular financial planner. A lot of firms these days are operating by a team approach where they have of subject matter experts that their planners can access if you have an estate planning question or a divorce question. And I know that our partner Edelman Financial Engines works like that. So if you do take us up on our offer to get that free financial plan with Edelman and you are thinking of going through a divorce, there will be experts in divorce, not necessarily who are your day-to-day contact, but who are on the team that can help. Yeah, that's so good to know. And I love what you guys were talking about with assembling your team, because having people that you can trust on your side is what this time in your life is all about. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. I'm sure there are some women who've gone through this without a therapist, but I would not want to have been one of them, right? I just needed a place to cry. And once a week I would go and I would cry for an hour and I would feel a little bit better. I don't know that I solved the problems of the world in her office, but I really relied on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's such a good point. We all need that impartial third party. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dig into some of the other questions that we've got. Yeah. Today, our first note comes to us from Tracy. She writes, hi, Jean. I'm an avid listener for the past few years, and I never miss an episode. I have a question regarding our home and climate change. Our home is in an AE flood zone and 100 years old. I've researched, and we didn't have a history of flooding on the property until this last hurricane season. During Ida, our home flooded, along with much of the area surrounding us in New Jersey. We did have flood insurance, but it only covered enough to repair the damage that the hurricane created. My question to you is this. It's been brought to my attention via our mayor that there's a state program to purchase flood zone homes from homeowners. Is this an option worth even considering? This program was developed to aid homes that were destroyed in Sandy, but has been given more funding from the federal government this year. We live in an NYC commuter town in New Jersey, close to trains and buses. Currently, I owe $270,000 on my property at 3.375% with a 15-year mortgage. This amount was refinanced in July of 2021. My spouse and I are 52 and 57 with a combined 401k of 300,000 and 20,000 in savings. Currently, the Zillow value of our home is 425,000, but the neighbors across the street just sold their home last month for 525. Even though the area is flooding, the property values seem to be going up. Yes, property values are going sky high and there's tough competition. Interest rates are almost 6% now. It makes me extremely worried that this might be my only chance to move my flood zone property. I'm worried FEMA will come along after another hurricane and force us to leave the area with pennies on the dollar. If we buy a new property, we're looking at something in the 550 to 600,000 range in our area. I did not envision us having to turn around and buy another property at our ages. We were planning to move to a less expensive area, possibly out of state, once I hit retirement age in eight or nine years. Although, where should we go? There's threat of fire, flood, and wind everywhere these days with climate change. Any insight on what direction to go or who to even talk to about this issue? We have a lot of research and predictions to make before we make any moves. Thank you so much. 
Wow. Thank you for writing, Tracy. And I'm recording this podcast in my house on Long Beach Island, which is an area that is also in New Jersey, was dramatically damaged by Sandy. So I know the programs that you're speaking about, I'm struck by a couple of things. First, I'm struck by the fear in your letter right? I mean, what you are trying to avoid is a situation where you don't have choices. And now because of the very active home buying market, you have potentially great choices. But with every successive interest rate hike, those choices probably are going to get fewer and further between. So here's what I would do. I would start doing both some shopping and look at what you might get if you were to sell. I would first call a realtor. There's no money lost in calling a realtor. Ask them to come over, give you a sense of what your home could be listed for, what it's likely to sell for in this market, and how long it is likely to sit on the market before it sells. What's happening in so many situations is that homes are going in a day. So you should know that if you decide to sell, you have the ability to set a time frame. in some cases. That's what we did when we sold our home in New York. We were able to say, yeah, we're gonna sell now, but we don't wanna move till June or July. And so we need a buyer who is willing to be cool with that. Simultaneously, I'd start looking for a new home. I'd start thinking with the number in mind that this realtor tells you you're likely to get for your home. I would start looking around at what you might be able to afford and where you might be able to afford it. And I would look at rentals as well as homes that you might purchase. I mean, it's possible that you purchase that home that you were thinking of purchasing in eight or nine years now. You purchase the second home now and you rent in the interim until you're actually ready to move there full time. The other thing that I would do is go and get pre-approved for a mortgage and look at hybrid adjustable rate mortgages. If you are going to buy a new house now and you know that you're only going to be there for eight or nine years, you're going to get a better deal on the interest rate by going with a hybrid arm. These are products that we have not talked about in years because interest rates have been so low. It didn't make any sense for anybody to take anything other than a 30 or a 15 year fixed rate loan. But now that rates are higher, it actually does. It makes sense to look into a hybrid that locks the first portion of the loan that fixes the first portion of the loan at a lower rate for about the number of years that you expect to be in that home. So you could look at a home that is a 7-1 arm, which means the interest rate is going to be fixed for the first seven years, after which it will begin adjusting and there's generally a cap on that adjustment so it won't be able to go sky high in the first year, which would give you time to get out of there. So that is a big, long list of things to do. And I would do them all. And I just sort of walk your way through it. And the other person that I would talk to is a financial advisor. I would talk to a financial advisor about your overall plan for getting from where you are now to where you want to be 10 years from now and to help you make that rent or buy decision. Those are such great points, Jean. Thank you so much. Sure. Our next question today comes to us from Amanda. She writes, Hi, Jean. I was hoping you could answer a question I haven't found a clear answer to, but I've heard a lot about over the years. I'm a 37-year-old single mom living and working in Minnesota. I work for the county government and make about $35,000 a year. My daughter's 12 and likely to go to college. I'm in a long-term relationship, and we've talked about getting married. However, I've heard my daughter would benefit greatly if she has a single parent when she applies for student loans. Is that true? I love my partner, but I don't want to burden my child with lots of student loans if it could be avoided by me simply waiting until after she's at college to get married. Thank you so much for your podcast. I still consider myself a novice when it comes to money, but your podcast and website has really helped me feel more financially literate. 
Thank you so much, Amanda, for the question. And you're right on track with this. Whoever is giving you advice is giving you really good advice because when we apply for financial aid as a divorced person or a single person, in general, the aid that is granted is based on the income of the custodial parent. That's you. You're a single mom. You're the custodial parent. If you get married, the income and assets of your now spouse, your daughter's step parent, also have to go on the financial aid form and they can be taken into consideration. So I would say if you really don't care, then don't get married right now. If this is a concern of yours, I would absolutely just hold on. If you're not married, then they don't have to report. Love that advice. And it's my understanding that this could also help with scholarships too, right? I would think so. I mean, I think scholarships and merit aid, other things are based on different factors than just financial need. But there may be scholarships out there that are for children of single mothers. And in that case, you could apply to those. Definitely. Thank you so much, Jean. Thank you, Catherine. In today's Thrive, let's talk about how to talk about getting a raise. Asking for a raise can be anxiety-inducing, even in the best of times, including today's environment when more employees than ever are in the driver's seat. According to the 2022 Compensation Best Practices Survey from Payscale, 50% of companies say that they are adjusting their pay strategy or structures for this year, and 92% of organizations are giving base pay increases in 2022. But even if you know you deserve a raise, asking if you can have one can still conjure up feelings of dread. Those feelings are understandable, but they're not insurmountable. If you're heading into a conversation with a manager, first take a deep breath and then arm yourself with information that can help you be more confident overall. Take a look at websites that aggregate salary data based on years of experience, job title, where you're located, and talk to other people in your industry about the current going rates. Once you've gathered salary data, it's time to compile your list of accomplishments and just detail all the ways you've added value. And then during your meeting, ask your manager for details about how your pay is determined. In other words, you want to understand the data your employer used when they offered you your salary and what their pay structure is. Ideally, your manager will be able to offer some sort of clarity around your pay rate based on your skills, experience, and performance. And while you want your request to be successful, and we want your request to be successful, there is no guarantee that your manager will be supportive of your request for more money. If the salary increase offered is less than you were looking for, then it's time for you to decide if you want to stay or you want to go. If you choose to stay with the organization, this is a good time to discuss when your next opportunity for a pay increase might arise and seriously evaluate if that number could get you to where you want to be. Remember that a no for now doesn't have to mean the end of the conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today on Her Money. Thanks to Kimberly Davis for offering so many great solutions from her playbook and helping us feel more confident about the road ahead. If you like what you hear, I hope you'll subscribe to our show at Apple Podcasts. Leave us a review. We love hearing what you think. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Edelman Financial Engines and BCU. We produce this podcast out of CDM Sound Studios. Our music is provided by Video Helper and our show comes to you through Megaphone. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll talk soon.